Chapter 47 Part 3 The weeks passed quickly, and then the Garden Club dinner was rapidly upon them, and Vivian had her transition meetings with the incoming president, a board member who knew what she was letting herself in for, so Vivian did not feel like she was being misleading when she said that it was a busy role, but that it could be managed. It even felt quite manageable suddenly, with the end in sight. With her speech written and her dress selected, Vivian went to work with Elizabeth on making the centerpieces, and then Gregory had to drive out to urgently fetch more ribbon, since they could not continue without it. When he returned, the florist delivery truck was misparked on the path that led out back to Gregory's parking area behind the greenhouse, and so Gregory pulled up his white Studebaker in Vivian's driveway. Vivian did not think too much of it at the time, but then as they were having an early dinner, Vivian heard the wheels of a second car pull into her driveway, and to her great surprise, it was Sophie. "'Oh, God's above!' cried Vivian, going clammy with fear. "'Go hide somewhere, quick!' she instructed Gregory. Maybe the backyard or something. It was a stupid idea. They could hide Gregory, perhaps, but they certainly couldn't hide his car. Vivian tried to make herself walk slowly to the front door, but even then she felt out of breath when she reached it and unlocked it. Oh, uh, uh, Sophie, uh, what a pleasant surprise, she said nervously. Uh, why are you here? Hello, mother, said Sophie. I am bringing you that Canadian evergreen. Don't you remember? We spoke about it last week again on the phone. By the way, whose car is that? Wh whose car is, is, is what? Is, is that? asked Vivian stupidly. Yes. Do you have a visitor? asked Sophie curiously stepping inside and looking about. "'Why, yes, as a matter of fact, there is a man here looking at the, um, the upstairs plumbing. Old houses, bad plumbing, you know,' said Vivian quickly. "'I have yet to meet a plumber who drives a white convertible,' said Sophie. "'He sounds fascinating. Perhaps I should sit here and wait until he comes down, so that I can see what he looks like.' "'Oh, no, no, you shouldn't!' cried Vivian. "'That is a very bad idea!' Sophie turned and gave Vivian a long look. "'You have a man visitor,' she said accusingly. "'And what he is doing upstairs does not sound like it is plumbing-related.' "'Oh, for heaven's sake, Sophie! "'Are you accusing me of having some sort of clandestine physical affair at my age?' "'I think you've been watching too much television,' said Vivian. She had broken into a sweat now. "'It is a man visitor, though. I can see that much is true,' said Sophie. "'Who is he, mother? And where is he hiding? If it's nothing clandestine, tell him he can come out of whatever closet you have made him stuff himself into. This is ridiculous.' There was no way to win this, Vivian saw. He's in the backyard, she sighed. It's Gregory, Sophie. Look, maybe we should talk first, and then... Gre... Gregory? Sophie looked as if someone had knocked the wind out of her.
she took what came next even less well than Nadine. She stomped through the entire house, stepped out onto the new deck, and when she saw Gregory calmly sitting there in the Adirondack chair like the emperor of landscaping, she screamed. "'Hello, Sophie,' said Gregory calmly. "'He... he, he is exactly like in the picture! Uh, how... how is this possible?' she cried. "'Is he dead? Is he a spirit? A monster? Ah! Uh, ah!' Vivian cut her off. "'He is none of those things. He is the man I have always loved,' she replied proudly. "'And then I suppose you are saying my father merely was—' "'A cat of the highest order!' cried Vivian. "'Everyone knows this. Was a federal indictment not evidence enough?' Sophie ignored her. "'What kind of evil magic is this?' she cried. She turned to Vivian. "'He has to go! How am I to live knowing that my mother is on friendly terms with such, such, such impossible things?' "'Sophie, this really has nothing to do with you,' said Vivian. "'Come inside, and we can talk about it.' Sophie hesitated, looking fearfully at Gregory as if he might kill her with a glance. "'Yes, listen to your mother, Sophie,' said Gregory mildly. "'It was good to see you again, if so briefly.' He smiled, and Vivian suddenly wondered if he realized— how much more beautiful than Vivian Sophie now was. Had been for years. Maybe had always been. With her shimmering blonde hair, her bluest eyes, and her tall, knockout figure. Ah! screamed Sophie, apparently terrified that Gregory could really speak, and then she raced inside. Vivian followed her. Now, please, get some control over yourself. No harm is going to come to you. I'm very sorry about all of this. It's nothing that is his fault or that he can do anything about, and it really isn't that big of a deal, although I grant you that it is unusual. He is an extremely kind and good man, and I'm very happy that he is here. D -d Does he live here? gasped Sophie. Well, yes, said Vivian. "'And sometimes Daniel is here when he is here?' asked Sophie fearfully and accusingly at the same time. "'No, I send Gregory away then. I want to give Daniel my undivided attention,' said Vivian. She did not harshly add that no one could truly enjoy anyone else's company while in the presence of a mulch-eating toddler. "'Now please, go home again and collect yourself.' Perhaps we can do some visits together in the future, but only once you are not so irrational about everything. Sophie made a face. Grandmother told me to be very suspicious of him. She never liked him. Yes, I know. It never changed anything in my heart, said Vivian. Then why did you marry my father, if you always loved Gregory? Sophie wanted to know. Because it is impossible to marry someone like Gregory, even if you really wanted to, said Vivian, and because I wanted to have you. Gregory cannot have children. There, now let me help you haul that bush out of your car, and then perhaps you had better get back on the road and visit again another day. What bush? asked Sophie, briefly disoriented. The Canadian evergreen you are here to give me, Vivian reminded her. They went out to the driveway, walked around Gregory's resplendent car, for which he had had a small shed built behind the greenhouse just to keep it this clean, and then they both wrangled the baby evergreen out of the passenger seat row of Sophie's car. We were thinking it could go out back by the fence, she mumbled. Vivian made sure the small tree stood balanced on the front lawn before turning to Sophie. "'Forgive me that Gregory's presence in my life has brought you unhappiness,' she said. His ageless face 
has turned normal living upside down. Before you had ever laid eyes on him, I had known him from girlhood on, and deeply loved him, and almost became engaged to him. When things go as nature intended, two decades later, one's daughter is not likely to fall in love with the mother's old beau. But things with Gregory are not as nature intended, and so that is what happened. You wondered then why this young man would choose me, or may wonder why he would choose me now. Well, clearly not because of how beautiful I am these days. Vivian gave a bitter laugh. You are so lovely, Sophie, so much more beautiful even as a girl than I ever was, and it would maybe seem like you and he would have made the perfect couple. But just look at me and think down the road. In twenty more years, you will look like me, and he will still look like that. Then at sixty-five, you will have so many wrinkles, everyone will call you grandma, even in the subway when you go to New York. But he will still look just like that. And then at eighty, when you have three chins and everything is sagging and you have the shape of a bag of overripe old fruit, he will still stand beside you, looking like he does right now. Would you really want that? Can you not imagine that that would be awful? Can you not imagine that it has been awful for me? I never got to marry the man I loved. I married a man who did not ever really love anyone besides himself, and then Gregory's face even damaged my relationship with you. You, my daughter, my only child. What family do I even have besides you and Daniel? And to have had to carry this awful secret all these years, and to never be able to tell anyone. Vivian shielded her eyes with her hand and wept. Sophie was crying, too. I'm, I'm sorry, she sobbed. I, I, I don't know what to do. I don't think I want to meet him again or uh, hear about him, all right? Or, or not for a while, at least. It's too awful right now. Vivian nodded mutely. I do understand, she said, wiping at her eyes. It is a lot to have to accept. Please do us no injury. And do not tell of this to anyone. If you endanger him and he has to go, I will go with him, and Daniel will have to grow up without a grandmother. I'm sorry, but after all these years, he has finally become my first loyalty, and I want to spend with him the time I still have left. Sophie nodded, climbed shakily into her car, told Vivian that she would see her in a few days' time at the annual garden club dinner, and then pulled out of the driveway so fast that the gravel scraped beneath her spinning tires. Well, that went well, thought Vivian bitterly, wiping at her forehead with her hand and sighing with relief and exhaustion. She went into the house and out to the deck, where Gregory was still sitting in his chair and had not moved. He was chewing on a twig of rosemary, as he enjoyed doing these days, and when he opened his arms and pulled her down onto his lap to sit with him and to kiss her, his mouth tasted wonderfully with the pine zing of rosemary. "'Are you having a hard day, beloved?' he asked her gently. "'I don't think there are words for the kind of day that this has become.' she said with a sigh. She is beautiful, isn't she? she asked, unable to help herself. Yes, very much so. Her husband is a fortunate man, and I am sure he knows it, and can appreciate her as she deserves, he said. For me, it is interesting how with the passage of the years I notice beauty less in the extraordinary than in the ordinary. Perhaps like great riches, astounding beauty also does begin to wear on you after the first two hundred years or so. 
after you've bought yourself all that money can buy, and adored up close every kind of beautiful woman, you may still discover that your heart is starving to death beneath your ribs, and you begin to long for something real, something deeply satisfying, something holy and good. And this real and good thing is what I have with you, Vivi, and no sight of a beautiful young blonde will make me forget that, so you have nothing to fear. Do not make us weak with your doubts. Rather, make us strong with your faith in us. You have my entire heart. Always. He kissed the top of her head. Now let's rehearse your speech once more, Madame President. You're going to be wonderful. Vivian's introduction to the role of club president a full year ago now had felt like a moment of victory and honor. This time around, having spent the past year actually doing the work for which the honor had been given, Vivian felt exhausted and ready to just hand off the gavel to the next lady. She would have happily just sent it in the mail and canceled the whole event, but she knew that the incoming president would need the shimmer and the public applause of the evening to get her through the hard work and possibly even grim moments in the year to come. Vivian dressed with care, putting on her faux pearl earrings and Gregory's mother's necklace. Gregory came over, kissed her back between her shoulder blades as he zipped up the back of her dress, said something flattering about hoping she would need help later to unzip it again, and then he helped her to pack what she needed for the evening, which wasn't all that much this time. He was wearing his dark charcoal gray suit and a blindingly white starched shirt, and there was a dark red rose at his suit lapel. Looking at him made her eyes hurt and her breath catch, that this resplendent and refined gentleman could hunt in the wild like a beast and catch giant, fast-moving fish with his bare hands seemed like a completely impossible thing. She shook her head to try to clear from it the image of him standing in the river in Alaska without any clothes on. If she didn't need to be thinking about that at a time like this. They agreed that Gregory would sit in the back of the room again, where he might be less of a distraction from garden club business, and by the time they arrived at the Lake Waramog Country Club and Vivian shook hands with everyone she knew and found her seat, Sophie and Edwin were already at a table approximately in the middle of the room. Oh, this could still be fun, Vivian sighed. Then she pulled out the agenda, walked confidently up to the microphone, and began the evening. An entire year of speaking and organizing and facilitating later, it was easier to do this kind of thing. Who said you couldn't get better at it? Didn't we tell the same thing to those new insurance salesmen in training, she thought. She thanked the new members, the old members, the members who were on the verge of quitting unless somebody gave them some recognition, the members who had done selfless acts of charity in support of the club during the year a few more agenda items, and she would be all done, and a future free of board meetings beckoned alluringly. The guests finished their dinners, and it was time for the speeches. Vivian's speech was shorter this time, but she gave it far more calmly, thanking both Elizabeth and Gregory particularly for all of their help. When she put her glasses back on to look out into the room, as the audience applauded, she could see Gregory standing up and clapping, the smile on his face so wide that it made him look about half his age. The incoming president then gave her speech, which was very good indeed. The man from the local paper insisted on getting his picture, and then everyone cheered, and the evening concluded. Gregory cut a path boldly through the mayhem and right up to Vivian's side, and she could see heads swivel as he moved through the room. 
spending so much time alone with him now. She had almost forgotten the unavoidable perils of taking him out in public, where his acute handsomeness cut through any crowd, and where all eyes were drawn to him, so that anyone else standing near him became all but invisible. She was both terribly proud and terribly pained and embarrassed, but then as people came up to shake her hand and to congratulate her on a year well managed, she regained her confidence and glowed with happiness. After a few minutes, Sophie and Edwin approached, and Vivian took a deep breath and made the awkward but unavoidable introductions. Edwin, Sophie, meet Gregory Morgan, family visiting from the South. Glorious Sophie, her golden hair done up to a Hollywood level of radiance, and her elaborate formal earrings swaying glamorously from her earlobes, looked like she might faint. The sight of Gregory and Edwin side by side was something so odd that even Edwin commented on it. "'Well, this is a bit strange. I feel like I'm meeting my doppelganger,' he said awkwardly. "'I hadn't considered the role of a Hollywood film star because I didn't have a stunt double. But if you would be interested in splitting the proceeds, we could try it,' he added with an affable smile. "'Films give me headaches,' said Gregory. "'Besides,' I hear you are a distinguished attorney, a job for which I think no stunt double is needed, unless you are very shifty indeed with the law. Edwin gave a polite laugh. Will you be visiting up north for long? he asked. I'm considering it, said Gregory vaguely. I have an apartment in New York. An amazing city, eh? said Edwin. As one man to another, there are some wonderful dinner and entertainment spots that I could recommend. I am now a happily married man, but if you are new to the area, well, perhaps that could be something for you. Edwin, we have to get going. Daniel's babysitter would probably love to get home before midnight, said Sophie quickly, which was unfortunate, because Vivian found herself wondering what sort of establishments, filled with naughty dancing girls— Edwin had in mind for Gregory, and she was shocked that he would mention such things in front of his wife and his mother-in-law. Perhaps the open bar had loosened his tongue? She was still thinking this when another man pushed through the crowd and came to stand near them. Tim? Tim Wells? she asked. Just like that, all amusement faded from mind. Oh, God, no. I came to congratulate you on your year leading the garden club, he said, extending his hand to her. I know how hard you work, and it has paid off. Oh, hello, Miss Sophie. Good to see you again, he turned to Gregory. And you must be... This is my husband, Mr. Wells, said Sophie. Meet Edwin Bradshaw. She pointed to Edwin in case it was unclear which of the similarly-looking gentlemen she meant. Tim shook hands with Edwin, and then his eyes went from the one man to the other. "'And who is this?' he asked. "'That's Gregory,' said Sophie eagerly. "'He's with my mother.' "'Oh, you little witch,' thought Vivian unkindly. "'What, what, what she means is—' began Vivian— "'Well, you've certainly upgraded,' said Tim. And then he blushed. "'Did I say that out loud? My pardons.' He looked again at Edwin and Gregory, perplexed. "'Has anyone ever said that you two—' "'All the time,' said Gregory smoothly. "'Well, good-bye, Mr. Wells. It was a pleasure.' And he grabbed Vivian by the elbow and steered her away. "'Who is this, Tim Wells?' He seemed rather miffed to find that you're off the market, said Gregory, strengthening the hold of his hand possessively about her arm. Oh, yes, him. He's the landscaper who helped design and put in my garden. We went out on some dates, had dinner a few times, that sort of thing. Then I broke it off. I just couldn't get serious about him, she explained quickly. And I guess now he knows why, 
said Gregory happily. No wonder he looked a bit deflated. He never loved me like you do, she added. Of course not, said Gregory loyally. Hmm, well, in that case, you have indeed upgraded. He laughed. In the crowd, a woman waved animatedly at Vivian. Vivian turned her head and stopped. In a moment, Sarah Linda had swept up to them. Oh, Vivian! She embraced her and air-kissed her cheeks. I simply knew you would be phenomenal. I knew it. Congratulations to you. Oh, I see your young friend is with you. How marvelous. I let you into the hall last year, if you will remember, she explained to him. And then she reintroduced herself to Gregory, blushing all the while. At last, she turned back to Vivian. Come, let's powder our noses and have a quick chat. The Daughters of the American Revolution are planning a new fundraiser, and I think your flower shop could be a nice part of it. Oh, all right, said Vivian. Gregory, would you mind helping to take my heap of bouquets out to the car meanwhile? He took her hand, bowed his dark head over it, turned it over, and kissed her palm deliciously in a way that he shouldn't have. Gregory smiled. Vivian blushed and hurried away with Sarah Linda, who had just seen more than she should have seen. "'I think it's great to see you with this passionate young man, Vivian,' gushed Sarah Linda. "'It fills all of us older ladies with hope,' she laughed. "'Now don't misunderstand,' said Vivian nervously. "'He is not—' Sarah Linda stopped applying her lipstick long enough to look up from her powder compact— and make direct eye contact with Vivian. Oh, come now, she said. It's obvious. You must be making him very happy. He looks so satisfied with you, like a man in love. His face just looks that way, said Vivian, dying of embarrassment. It's something to do with, with bone structure. It runs in the family. Sarah Linda laughed enthusiastically. He is also not as young as he looks. Honestly, I mean that in all seriousness, said Vivian. You don't have to justify it to me, said Sarah Linda. He looks magnificent. Enjoy him, Vivian. God knows we all would if we had the option. Now, about this proposed fundraiser. I was thinking... Vivian had no idea later what Sarah Linda had been thinking, because the inside of her head suddenly sounded full of radio static, turned up to maximum volume. How dare she? Was everyone going to take liberties with Vivian's reputation this evening? And it wasn't even true. And Vivian didn't even want it to be true anymore. It was slander, that's what it was. By the time she got into the parking lot where Gregory was waiting for her, she was so upset she thought she would cry right there in front of everyone. "'Nobody understands!' she cried as she sat down in the car, and Gregory closed her door before getting in on his side and starting up the engine. Thank God she had convinced him to drive her Volkswagen Beetle rather than taking his white convertible. "'Nobody understands, and nobody will ever understand! I'm so embarrassed! It's like I'm robbing the cradle here to have a man so young!' All I get is these lewd insinuations that we're having unmarried intercourse when we're not. And you don't help matters by kissing me like that in public. Nobody knows the truth. Forgive my kiss, beloved. I should have done more to restrain myself. But do they need to know the truth? Asked Gregory calmly, maneuvering the wheel around a pothole in the parking lot and heading out to the road. What business is it of theirs, if we are sitting side by side in our pajamas all night, reading actuarial tables, or whether I'm drinking champagne from your navel all night after fantastic intercourse? In either case, it is something only between us. Why do we have to make everyone understand? What if we just left everyone else alone, to think what they will? What harm would come of that? Is it the Middle Ages, and is someone going to tar and feather us? No, 
so let them go about their own thoughts and their own business. This is one of the nicest things, in fact, about the modern age, that you needn't be bothered by others about your private life. You are worrying about needless things. Is that what your guru would tell me? sniffed Vivian. Yes, it, it most certainly is, said Gregory. Atta made me realize how many of my troubles and pains were self-caused, or at least self-magnified. If we can find calm on the inside, it becomes far less likely that anyone from the outside will be able to rattle it. Here, he said, letting go of the wheel with one hand and reaching over and pulling the dark rose from his lapel. In the language of flowers, a dark red rose means the deepest passion and adoration of love, which is exactly how I feel about you. She took the flower from him with trembling fingers and brought it up to her cheek. You are wonderful tonight, Vivi, and I am exceedingly proud of you. But even more than that, I am over the moon with delight, now that I will have more of your time to myself, he told her. I have had to share you too much. Don't you think we should relax more and do more of what we want? Every board meeting night, we should drink bourbon and vermouth or port or sherry and just laugh at the whole thing and rejoice that it is over. Are you suggesting we should get drunk once a month? asked Vivian, unable to suppress a tiny, silly giggle, despite the fact that tears still clung to her cheeks and discovering that wiping at them with a rose was not very efficacious. I don't do that any more, but you might try it, he said with a smile. I will keep you company, and make sure that you don't do anything too ridiculous, like go to bed with your shower cap still on. There, now you are smiling again. Don't let anyone take away from you your sense of accomplishment or your feeling of joy. That is yours, and yours alone. And if you lose it, no one can replace it for you. Believe me, I should know. It was not long after the dinner, when one of the most significant events in their relationship took place. They had just returned from a celebratory luncheon at a local restaurant, where they had toasted Vivian's retirement from the club presidency, and Vivian was still wearing her elegant luncheon dress when she went out into the garden to cut back a few plants and to tend to the rose bushes. It looked as if a storm was going to come up. Although it was unusually warm, the wind had already started to blow, and the sky took on a strange, yellowish-gray, end-of-the-world kind of light. She worried that if she did not finish in the garden now, she would not get to it any more, and the rest of the day would be wiped out by rain. Gregory happily wearing a favorite gray suit with a light blue shirt, sat in his favorite Adirondack chair on the new deck and watched her, his eyes half closed, and she thought she could almost hear him purring contentedly. He was humming melodies from a Gilbert and Sullivan performance that they had just gone to see the week before, and his face wore a rare, soft smile. He had been proud of her time as club president, but he certainly made no bones about how delighted he was that her hectic year was over at last. He knew he would get more of her time now, and as that was the primary currency of happiness in his world, it was clear that he could not wait for that time to begin. Vivian tried to work quickly with the small garden pruner, and that was when it happened. Her finger caught on a rose thorn. She felt the pinch, the flash of pain, and as she dropped the hand pruner to the ground with a cry, blood already welled up where the skin of her finger had been pierced. Gregory was off the deck and beside her, 
before she even knew he had moved, his face full of worry. But in the next instant, the look on his face changed. He had not looked down, but she knew he could tell she was bleeding. He froze, fear in the back of his eyes. They stood near each other, neither one daring to move a muscle, and she looked up at his face. Don't run away, she said finally, breaking the silence. He looked down at the ground, and a shiver went through him. Is this fear, she asked quietly, or is it desire? For a while it looked as if he was having difficulty speaking, but then he whispered, Fear and desire can be one, beloved. Show me, she told him, and she held up her finger to him. Inexplicably, there was enough blood there to be justified by a half-inch cut rather than a mere thorn prick. He looked down at it as if transfixed. No, no, Vivian, he murmured. She could see his shoulders quivering. The wind picked up around them, pulling on her dress and bringing their garments together so that they touched the sweep of her dress's skirt brushing against his dark suit trousers. Show me everything, she whispered in an urgent, low voice, more besotted with emotion than she had ever allowed herself to be in all her life before. He gasped. It was like watching a film played in slow motion. He raised her hand up to his lips and then placed her finger against them. It was the faintest kiss but she could feel it down to her toes, like electricity chasing along her spine. And then as she watched, the blood began to flow ever more rapidly. So much blood for such a small cut, a small red rivulet against her skin. Gregory had stopped breathing entirely. His eyes focused as if mesmerized, on the movement of the blood as it flowed out of her wound. Please, she breathed. Oh, please. The rivulet widened further into a fast-flowing stream, moving down her finger, insistent on getting to its goal. You, you want me to? He struggled, staring. Yes, she whispered and then she gasped as he lowered his dark eyelashes and took her finger into the wet coolness of his mouth. He moaned, and his eyes closed, and his face took on the expression of a man dreaming in a faraway world of his own. Then suddenly, Vivian felt a pull so strong on her veins that she almost fell over. His free arm quickly moved about her waist, and caught her strongly against him, and then she felt him pull on her veins again, and her entire body seemed to turn to liquid around them. No bedroom lust had ever even approached the strength of this force, 
this incandescent longing. He pulled his mouth away, shaking with the effort and causing small fires to erupt at all of her nerve endings. Her wound looked white now, with no blood to be seen. I want you to, to, to have me, she managed to tell him. I know, I know, my God, yes, I know, he whispered, moving his hand away from hers and running it through her hair, kissing her along her chin and beneath her earlobe. But I cannot, I don't know if I can stop, he moaned. And if you don't stop, she asked him. Then you will die, he told her simply. There was only the sound of the wind and the scraping sound of leaves shifting about in the garden. She looked up into his eyes and they sparkled like dark diamonds. Around them, the wind picked up again. The blood began to run down her finger once more, insistent on giving itself to him. She saw him look down at it, distraught and full of a hunger that she now well understood. He appeared to be hesitating, and then he moaned once more, and she saw in his eyes that it was too late to resist. He had been overcome. Shackled like an animal Chained to my desires Just another sacrifice To love's eternal vice Take me with your tenderness Break my brittle heart Easily and elegantly tear my world apart I'm a man of flesh and bone Rapture rushing through my veins Passion flaming in my heart Heaven is surrounded He began shaking, and she reached out her free arm to entwine it about his waist this time, pulling herself closer, and then she gave him her hand again, and he took it with a small cry, and her injured finger disappeared again inside his hungry, insistent mouth, which was getting warmer and warmer. As he drank her in, she could feel the pull on all of her body, and it was so achingly delicious that she thought she might actually topple over the thin line into shattering physical ecstasy. There was an unremitting, lustful, obscene rhythm to what his mouth was now doing, a process which bore the fingerprints of originating from the same nature as did other processes of lust. Each inward draft that he took carried her deeper into him, just as in physical love between a man and a woman, the movements of their bodies would have swept them ever deeper together. And then there was a pause in which the lust regained strength. The wind, the garden, and the world seemed to fall entirely away. Somewhere there was the sound of angel voices, of someone singing, of glorious and holy rapture sweeping down on large gray wings, and she could feel as they beat in the air around them and moved the wind against her face. Gregory had let go of her hand and lifted her off the ground to pick her up and cradle her against him like a child. 
Her finger was still in his mouth, connecting them to one and the same craving now. Her pulse holding all of his attention. There was no pain here, just a softness and a longing that was more essential and more powerful than any other longing in this world. The only thing she wanted was to melt away and pour herself entirely into him, all of her vanishing, vanishing. He pulled fiercely now, pull after pull, leaving tenderness behind, and her veins' contents raced towards his waiting mouth, leaving all of her circulatory system throbbing and crying out for him. Ravished by love and losing strength moment by moment, her heart lurched and skipped a beat. The sweet sensation of submission and of passionately giving herself to him was everywhere, and it was delicious. Why had she ever feared this? There was nothing here but the most sublime desire. She had the momentary rational thought of wondering whether everyone felt this with him, or if it was only her. Oh, he gurgled, pushing her finger out of his mouth, which was filled with ruby red. Oh, God, oh, how you rush to give yourself to me. I move my lips, and you rush into me like a wave. It has never been like this. Oh, no more, no more, love. Oh, I cannot, oh, I cannot, I cannot. His eyes closed tightly shut, and he dropped to his knees on the ground, with her still in his arms. No. No, she begged feebly. No, don't stop. No, no, no. Suddenly she was crying hysterically against his chest. If he stopped now, she would never know another moment's happiness in this existence for as long as she still lived. If I do not stop, he said raggedly, this will be your last day on this earth. And I love you too much. I need you desperately. Tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that. She brought her finger to his lips again, and he let go of her, tumbling her onto the lawn. Her glasses fell off onto the grass somewhere. She pulled herself to her knees, lifted up her hand to him, and watched as his resistance broke once more, and his eyes closed, and he took her finger into his mouth once more, and pulled on her veins. Ah, oh, God, there was no sweetness left in the world but this, to be right here, to be taken like this, and to let it never stop. Her body arced toward him as if caught by a large magnetic force, and she heard a cry rip from her lips. That seemed to get his attention. He moved his fingers feebly around her hand as if trying to catch it, to pull it out, but he could not do it. He was so far gone. At last he settled for pulling his head back with a groan, his eyelids fluttering open, but his eyes almost rolling up into his head, red running at the corners of his mouth, and then he became incoherent with desire, hands clawing weakly at the earth, and his shoulders shaking. His mouth moved silently, but the ability to speak had left him. He looked so broken, so overcome, and it was so clear that he was acutely suffering the loss of her now, that she reached out again to console him, but her hands never closed about him. All of a sudden, his voice spoke in her mind, as loudly and clearly as if he had spoken it with his lips. Go. Go now. Do not run, or you will die, he said inside her mind. Vivian hesitated, 
feeling her heart bleeding out toward him with this immense love, unwilling to leave him. Now, Vivian, he said inside her mind. It was the strongest command he had ever given her. She tried to rise to her feet, but she must have lost more blood than she realized, because when she tried to stand up, she fell. His eyes tore open and he looked at her for a split second, as if he did not know who she was. That frightened her, and she scrambled up again. His fingers clenched as he dug them into the soil, like a revenant, looking to return to the grave. Must not run, must not run. Her heart pounded so fast, she thought it would shatter. As slowly as she could, she backed away. Go in the house, he said inside her mind. Now. She half crawled up the steps to the deck, and then made it across its surface and to the back door. She opened it, pulled herself inside, and shut it. Through its glass panel, she saw him stand up, sway, look desperately toward the house, and then he raced through the garden, leaped the back fence in a single bound, and vanished from her sight. In the next instant, the rain came down fiercely, drenching everything. Vivian slid down weakly against the back door and closed her eyes, panting and listening to the sound of the rain. She needed him. Oh, how she needed him now. She had never needed him more. Why did he get to decide that they had to stop? She sobbed helplessly and called his name over and over. By the time she stood up shakily to go look for a bandage, she had bled all over her dress and the kitchen floor. You could stop now, she told the wound angrily. He is gone. She wondered how much blood she had actually lost. Light-headed, she bandaged herself up and cleaned everything as best as she could while shaking like a leaf, and then she pulled herself weakly into the living room, where she rolled herself up in her small armchair and waited for the sense of incredible regret and despair to leave her. She wanted to get a blanket, but felt too weak to move. Sleep came in a shade of oblivion. Gregory did not return until late in the night. She immediately felt he was there. He woke her when he let himself in through the back door and then came soundlessly through the house and came upon her in the dark of the living room. Gregory? She called softly into the inky shadows of the night. He came to kneel beside her chair, set her glasses that he had apparently found outside down on the coffee table, and as she reached out her hand, she felt the tears on his face. Are you all right? Forgive me, my beloved love. Oh, can you ever forgive me? He whispered. There's nothing to forgive, she told him. I wanted this. Wanted still. I frightened you, he sniffed. And I broke my promise from long ago. My first promise. You don't even know. I... I hurt you. How could I have ever hurt you? No. No, I wanted you. In just that way, she told him. Could you not feel it? Ah, yes, he breathed. You raced into me full speed, like the child Vivian, when you tore around the corner at the clinic, and all I could do was try to catch you. My mouth could hardly keep up with you as you hurled yourself at me. It was a collision, an attack, an explosion of fire. It has never been that way with another, I swear it. Ah, part of me knew that it would be like that if I ever let it happen. Things inside her chest felt like they were being rearranged by a pair of glowing fire tongs. How was it different than with others? she whispered. 
It was immense. It was every hunger and lust I have ever known rolled into one. It had a will of its own, and it was extremely difficult to control. I have never wanted anything like that, like I wanted you, like I want you right now. You cannot begin to understand the depths of your appeal to me, how it feels to have these hungers aroused, and how it feels to hold this inferno in my throat for you practically all of the time. With others it is different, and of course the glow only gets me close. But once, once, well, creatures fight me. They don't want to die. They don't want to give anything up to me. Once it starts, a belated sobriety and fear comes over people, and they fight me. It is the worst part that I feel people's fear and know that I am the cause, that I am the monster threatening them and making them feel so afraid. But you, you were fearless. You rushed out and took complete control of me, like you wanted me to have all of you right then and there. I half think, if I had not taken you in my mouth, you would have bled to death in front of me, even from this small wound flowing across the ground to me in an attempt to get in. She nodded. It is true. I feel it even now she said, caressing his cheek. I felt it when you walked back in, like the moon pulling on the oceans to make the tide. It tugs on my veins. I don't think it would do that for anyone but you, no matter how many other creatures like you there might be. I wonder if it will always be like that between us now, after today. How do they not want to give you everything? I don't know, Vivi. I don't know, he murmured, tears running down his face against her fingers. Ah, but how could I have done this? And I think you should have done it long ago already, she told him. Then we would have understood everything. I am yours. No, no, I lost my self-control, I lost my holiness, I lost the ideal, I lost everything. It was like that other time, after the accident, when you lay in the street, and I waited for the ambulance to come and get you, and your blood was all over the sidewalk. I thought I had killed you, and then I thought that if you were already dead, perhaps it would not make much difference if— The fragrance of you was so delicious as it came across to me— carried on the breeze, the most delicious sin that anyone has ever suffered from the glory of. Oh, how I hate what I have become, he said vehemently, and then he hung his head and wept. And I love it, she told him passionately. I'm not afraid of you. I desire exactly what you are and want only to give myself to you. Can you not believe me after this? But if I were different, if I could have been an ordinary man with you, if we could have been happy together, he sobbed. I always felt you were not an ordinary man, she told him. I desire this. I don't know what it is like to be you, but for me there was extreme pleasure in feeling my life passing into you. Anything that I ever felt in a bedroom somewhere pales in comparison. I think I would have passed into you and vanished at the end with the greatest rapture that it is possible for any living creature to feel. There is no need even for paradise after a feeling like that. No, no need for paradise? You were in earnest? You, you really wanted this? He asked weakly. In that way? Yes, she told him. You cannot understand how much. The somber silence of the room swept across them for a long time. Oh, God, but it cannot happen again, he finally said, 
his voice laced with urgent despair. Understand that, next time, knowing, knowing how much, I, I couldn't stop. I understand that, but it will never stop me from longing for it, she said. Oh, Vivian, Vivian, he cried, draping an arm miserably about her neck. How can anyone want this? You may have lived for a long time with your secret, but it is not the only secret, and it does not mean that you know everything there is to know about how your kind of magic works, she said into the dark. I was ready to die when I heard you speaking to me in my mind, telling me to go, she said. I heard you also, he sniffed, just before I let you go. I saw you as a small child standing barefoot beside me, in your white hospital nightgown, telling me firmly that you loved me, but that I had to let you go right then and there. How strange. He was silent for a while. Oh, will things ever be right between us again after this horror? They are all right already now, she told him. Forgive me for having brought us so close to danger. I caused it, I know, but I cannot bring myself to regret it. I will never, ever regret it. That something so beautiful could still be... Dying was beautiful, he asked hoarsely. No, becoming yours, drop by drop, was, she replied. Come here and hold me. Ah, that you would even let me after this, he groaned. Never have I been yours more than now, she said, kissing him passionately. You are so beautiful, and I am in awe, and I love you so much. It is clear to me now how we are connected. Our connection runs in my heart and in my veins that is why we have kept getting thrown together throughout my life. Our paths interweave. My heart and what is in it is yours, both the man's and the beast's. You are perfect as you are, Gregory Morgan. And now that I understand this, I would have you no other way. Never spend another moment wishing that things had been different between us. My last regret just bled out of me today. We fit together exactly, just as you are. And I have spent all of these many years terrified of what you would say if you only knew the truth about me, that you would curse me, that you would leave me, that you would injure yourself, he said, the fear followed me everywhere, making me watch what I told you, what I revealed, what you might see. Every time we interacted, in the background I feared whether it might lead to me losing you. And now... And now I know everything. And I love you still, she told him simply. Like Cyrano, he said. Yes. Fear nothing ever again. You don't have to explain or hide or deny anything. It doesn't matter any more. Let that barrier and any others that might remain between us be gone forever, she told him. Do you know that the friend that I came to visit at the clinic in Metairie when you were a little girl was there because he had tried to kill himself after he told everything to Marie? the woman he loved, and she could not bear to live with these truths. She leaped to her death from a tenth-story window rather than face these things. I feared you might not be able to face them either. To discover that you can, oh, it exceeds all of my prayers, he murmured. You should have known me better, Gregory Morgan, when I must... I can face anything, she told him ardently. 
I have underestimated you, yes. But perhaps now you are underestimating us, he said. I did not realize that we are connected in this way. But I think there are even more powerful ways in which we are one, beyond any physical symptom or phenomenon, a deeper magic at work at the level of the spirit. Observe and feel. Does your heart not tell you that this is so? he murmured. I have long been of the opinion that the greatest love cannot come until all secrets are let go and all barriers fall, she told him. Now you see that I have been right. As ever, he told her meekly, and then he kissed her, stood up, picked her fragile body up in his arms, and then he carried her to the sofa where they lay together in the darkness, looking for that soft resting place on the other side of desire. He lay trembling, his lips not far from her collarbone, and she knew that he did desire her and that they were drowning in each other with each breath. She moved her fingers into his hair and shifted herself closer so that she could burrow her nose into it and smell the intoxicating scent of him, of wood smoke, and of matches. Here was warmth and sweetness and so much love that it was a palpable element in the space between their two bodies. She felt her soul separate from her body and go seek him out, to be closer, because no closeness in this world could ever be enough. It was love-making without any making, without any movement, without needing or missing anything, just the love itself, and it was ensconced within a meditation, as Gregory would call it. His heart rang out with its low, inhuman, gong-like boom against her, and she sighed to have it near once again. Was there more? Then all of this, was there some other magic? Or was this one magic that they were in just deeper and more expansive than either of them had previously thought? She put her attention to studying it closely, listening to their bodies as they lay so tightly entwined. Her breath balanced against the much slower pace of his and then the world came in tightly about them, as if nothing else in the universe existed, and within it their heartbeats spoke confidentially to each other of the unspoken depth of all things, and of everything that had just passed. About two weeks later, and once Vivian had fully regained her strength, they were standing together in the warm kitchen in the noon sunlight and wordlessly making a salad together. Gentle music was playing from Gregory's record player, an album called Getz Gilberto that he particularly liked. It was a moment filled with the best of their relationship, only deepened now by their recent expanded intimacies as he had nurtured her back to health. These recent evenings now, she let him carry her up to bed and then wait for her while she dressed in her nightgown and put down her hair and brushed it out, put on her face cream, or sometimes she let him draw a bath for her. To be allowed to sit here and watch you take down your hair, oh, can you even imagine 
what it means to me, he murmured, gazing at her from beneath his dark eyelashes. She laughed. You must be a very old-fashioned gentleman indeed, to have your interest be caught by something so demure. These days, I would think that the men expect a little more. He gave her a smoldering look. Yes, there is, ultimately, the longing for more. But this is part of a beautiful, exciting, and intimate preamble, and any man unable to see that is a fool. Married women did not wear their hair down in my day, so it was a sensual delight, reserved just for one man, and that in and of itself speaks volumes about its importance. Some cultures are still like that, I understand, said Vivian, turning back to her mirror and continuing to move the brush through her hair. That I dislike, actually, said Gregory. No, it should be a private and passionate understanding between a couple, not a societal expectation. It should feel like an intoxicating prelude to an act of passion, not like rule-following. Otherwise, what is the point? He made a face. She finished with her hair, came to him to let him run his fingers through it because she knew that would give him pleasure. And then, when she came to bed, he let her decide if she wanted to undress him and remove his shirt or not, and then they would lie together in the darkness in silence, on top of the fur blanket, with her ear against him, or with his cheek against hers, and he would hold her and tell her how much he loved her. What point was there in trying to hold up any barriers between them? Do you know how deeply wonderful it is to be cared for, she asked him. How wonderful is it, beloved? Tell me, he purred against her ear, tightening his arms about her. Why tell you? I will show you. Tomorrow I will draw a bath for you, she said. She was unsure if he would accept, but she found a bottle of bubble bath and poured it in, hoping that that would address his need for personal modesty, as well as keep her from staring at him too much. The net result was so perfect that she could hardly believe it. He undressed, lowered himself into the bath, his long limbs hanging out over the edge of it. "'What is this?' she asked after a few minutes, pointing to a faint scar on the back of his calf before he pulled his leg back into the water." Ah, oh, I took some shrapnel to the leg in the Great War, he said. It was nothing too bad. It was terrifying because I bled a lot, and because my blood is different than yours, so I feared being discovered as being different. But luck was with me, and the attending surgeon trying to pull all the pieces of metal out of it said nothing. I wondered afterwards if perhaps he might not be... Well, if he might know... It was a close call, but it all ended well. My hero, she said, kissing his shoulder, and then she knelt beside him as if he were Sophie when she was still little, and she shampooed his hair. Giving himself wholly over to her care, he looked like a man lost in ecstasy, his eyes closed and his mouth open slightly, Happiness stamped all over his face. She ran to get a pitcher and then poured water over the top of his head, rinsing off his hair and reminding her instantly of him rising up out of the river in Alaska. She rubbed his wet shoulders and chest with the washcloth, then figured, why should the washcloth have all the delight? And she touched him with her bare fingertips. He reached up with his wet hand to catch her fingers, and then he kissed them, each, one by one, his head bent down and water droplets hanging onto his long eyelashes. Like a mythological beast, he looked like a cross between two things, with a face so boyish that he looked almost like a child now, but with the body of a man. 
And of course, she now knew the truth, which was that he was really neither one. And he had been right, she realized as she watched him, her heart melting inside of her chest. It had been foolish to say no to every physical form of affection just because some could no longer be had and others no longer be born. Even just innocently bathing him and touching him like this vastly expanded the range in which she could express her love for him. Her hand moved along his shoulders and then along the front of his chest above the water line in the bathtub, not wanting to break his new trust with her. But she had the feeling that she could touch him anywhere now and he would not hold up any further barriers. The last of his defenses had fallen and he was willing to be all hers, perhaps for the first time ever, giving even the parts of himself that she was prepared to take solely on faith. His skin was so soft that it did not seem possible it could be so, had anything ever felt so magnificent. The soapy water had made him warm and silky, and it was exactly like petting the tiger in him that she had always longed to pet. The boom of his heart reverberated beneath her hand and pulled on her veins the closer in she leaned, as had happened when he had, when they had. Oh, what bliss in the mere memory! And now the whole world was right here, hyper-focused in the sensation beneath her finger pads. Small drops of water falling here and there from the faucet into the bath water were the only sounds, and accentuated the silence that was all around them. I am loved. Oh, I am loved. I am loved. He sighed ecstatically, his eyes closed, lost to rapture, and a shiver sweeping his glorious shoulders. Seeing it, she thought she might die of the thrill. Sometimes I think that the first love of childhood was the best love of all, he said after a while, and she realized all over again how long it had been since anyone had cared for him at all, and how long he had been plagued by self-doubt and having to hide his true nature. He hungered for this kind of acceptance and care far more than he still hungered for any kind of physical passion, and it was a glorious delight to be able to give this to him and to savor him in a new way at the same time. This was, without any doubt, the best way to pay him attention. She pulled over his hand, which was holding her hand, and she kissed his large, warm, wet palm the way he had so often done with her, tasting the water on her lips and wondering briefly why it was that women were not to kiss men's hands when it felt so delicious to do it. Of course you are loved. You are loved for yourself, as you are. I'm pretty sure I have loved you all of my life, she told him softly. Maybe even before whatever is before, if anything. She kissed him again, and he squirmed slightly, but it did not seem that it was out of discomfort. And now you are both loved and clean, she said more lightly. Thank you, he murmured, still lost somewhere, but yet she felt that she was there with him. My pleasure she said, amazing herself at how fully and earnestly she meant the words, rather than intending them just as a replacement for your welcome. Then, later, she told him happily, I feel I am right at the center of your world. Because you are, he assured her, kissing her passionately. 
We couldn't have had this kind of time for each other when Sophie was little, she told him. My life has always been so busy. Where would we have found the time to be with each other and care for each other like this? Oh, I don't know. I think we would have done all right, he murmured, kissing her hair. And I think that life gave us this now, because you have been so short-changed, she told him. You lived through so much unhappiness and misery. How can I complain? Gregory told her. I have use of my limbs, of my health, of my youth, and I have never known material lack. But you have suffered profoundly in other ways, she said. Can you deny it? I don't even want to waste the breath to deny it. But we have to live in this day, and not in some other day in the past. Trust me, Vivi, no one has spent more time living in the past than me. But I don't want to live there any more. I want to live here, with you, he said. And I would have none but you also, she assured him with a smile. Now, even in something as mundane as salad-making, there was a new and passionate tenderness between them, and as Astrud Gilberto sang Corcovado, their hands worked together on adding ingredients into the salad bowl. It all seemed to make sense. Some days you made love, and some days you made salads, thought Vivian. But the magic and the joy of Gregory was that he brought the same amount of devotion and attention to both. Whiskey moved contentedly between their feet, rubbing himself against their ankles as they worked. The scent of rolls baking in the oven filled the air with a delicious scent as only baking bread can do. It was a salad probably large enough for six, but neither of them seemed to mind. Gregory knew what was needed, and his fingers moved so swiftly at times that they were almost a blur. Nobody had to tell him what to do, and... In the end, when the moment called for it, he opened a drawer and pulled out the salad-tossing utensils and handed them with shining eyes to Vivian so that she could do the honors. She took the tongs, tossed the salad together in the bowl, added the dressing that she had been working on, tossed everything again, and then she lifted the bowl, looked up at him with an immensity of love that she wanted to tell him of, but that words were insufficient for. And then she handed the bowl to him, along with her entire heart. Quiet nights of quiet stars Quiet chords from my guitar Floating on the silence that surrounds us Quiet thoughts and quiet dreams Quiet walks by quiet streams And a window that looks out on Corcovado Oh, how lovely 